per bond, okay, which means that you can't have any more than this, is going to be 2 to the power mhx okay, messages per second. Oh, sorry, messages in each second. Okay, so in one second, how many different messages could you be possibly be sending? It's this, so the answer to the second one is going to be 2 to the power 198. You could be sending as many as 2 to the power 198 messages, distinct messages in just one second. So that's the answer. But let's just think about it for a moment. It's astounding, right? 2 to the power 198 is like 10 to the power, I don't know, 10 to the power 60, or so yeah, it's like 10 to the power 65, okay? <coughs> Now, how many protons are there in the universe? This is something everybody should know. How many protons in the universe? Does anybody know this? 10 to the 80. 10 to the 80, thank you. Good. Remember that, it's very important. Okay, 10 to the 80 protons in the universe, which means that uh, it's unlikely there are more sand grains on the beach than the, 10 to the, than the protons in the universe. So 10 to the 80 is like this magic number. Okay, which you should always remember. If anything exceeds 10 to the 80, your answer is typically wrong. Okay. <laughs> okay. So if you say bank balance is 10 to the 81, you know there's a mistake somewhere. Okay. <laughs> because can't, there's just only 10 to the 80 protons in the universe. We are pretty close to uh, 10 to the 80 over here. And in fact, this is only in one second. Okay. If I take 10 seconds, okay, then I have you know, 10 to the 66. Okay, and I have whatever, 10 to 15 seconds. Well, if I just increase the bit rate a bit more, and I have, you know, instead of just four symbols, more symbols, and so on, I can get to 10 to the 80 pretty quickly. And you're saying, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. How can I possibly have this? Okay, um, and the way to think about this is this is the number of distinct entities that can be represented using 198 bits. And it is, in fact, 2 to the 198. That's how many different things you can represent with 198 bits. It's a lot. Right? To make you feel even worse, let's say that you have an MP3, uh, it's not MP3, let's say a movie, which is one gigabyte. One gigabyte is going to be eight gigabits. Okay, it's eight into 10 to the power nine bits. Okay, it's approximately 10 to the 10 bits. So the number of possible movies you could represent as this is two to the power 10 to the power 10 possible movies <laughs> can be represented using 10 to the 10 bits, okay? That's way more than 10 to the 80, okay? Uh, I don't know how much this is, it's 10 to the past something horrible, okay? <laughs> and so uh, we can actually take logarithms and, and figure it out, I suppose. So the number of possible representations of one hour movies that are stored using a gigabyte, okay? is way more than the number of protons in the universe. So, so this is almost sort of the magic of, it's a magic of logarithms, it's a magic of exponentiation, which is that we only have one gigabyte, yet you can represent more movies than the number of protons in the universe. Okay, so, so coming back to this over here, 198 bits from this perspective is quite a lot. Okay, 198 bits, you can represent a very, very large number of, number of things. Approximately 10 to the 65 different objects can be shown over here. And this is what makes me weep when I see XML. Because XML is a, such a waste of bits, you know, bracket open, bracket close, big string tags, and then a slash, and then the whole thing repeated. It, you know, it's an enormous amounts of redundancy, and all these beautiful bits are being wasted, you know, on things like brackets and slash and... Uh, who came up with this? Unfortunately, somebody from University of Waterloo. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's all I can say. Uh, this, this guy who came with XML used to be a, a research associate with Professor Frank Tompa many years ago, and then he went to Sun, and then that's where he did this stuff. So everybody in computer networking like rolls their eyes because this is, this is sort of an application level guy trying to do networking or whatever. So, so of course, what we do is we take this and we immediately put it into a source code and we take all the redundancy out of it, okay? So that we're not wasting beautiful bits on, on horrible things like that, okay? So despite the facetiousness, what I'm really trying to say over here is that even a small bit rate, 198 bits per second, is actually a very large bit rate. In terms of the representative power, it is a lot, 
And when we talk about you know, 100, gigabit, uh, 100 gigabit per second optical fibers, which actually exist, or you know, long distance uh, can be uh, 40 gig, 100 gig, uh, 100 gigabits per second is an enormous, enormous information rate. Okay? It's just unbelievably high. Okay? Uh, and uh, you know, it's amazing that we can actually do it. And the, the representative power is, is actually uh, is huge. Okay? So uh, that was one of the things I wanted to get across this homework example was that you can actually get 2 to the power 198 distinct messages. Yeah? So the total number of messages uh, is 4 to the power of 10, I believe. That's right? 4 to the power of? 4 to the power of 10. Because uh, each message has 10 characters. Yeah. And each character uh, can be one of those 4. Right, per messages, correct. Yeah, but we have over here 10. Uh, so, okay, we'll come to that when we do this third and fourth example. Yeah, that is 4 to the power 10 per message. Per message. And then this is over 10 messages per second. Yeah, that's right. But the, yeah. the question asks for the number of distinct uh, messages. Yeah. So the, the offer one that you provided, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. But uh, that's a very big offer one. Uh, Okay, I'll come to that. The, 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 uh, okay, we'll, we'll come to that. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Um, the, this is not, uh, okay, interrupt is real, right? So do we say that the upper bound is 1 to 198 or 198 point something? Ah, it doesn't matter, 198 or, yeah, but there is some point somewhere, something over there, yeah. Okay, but it's still. A little bit more than that, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So I guess the way I would put it, uh, Mohammed, is that if you have 198 bits, you can you can create two to the power 198 different uh, message sequences from it. Okay, that's the answer. And if you have only 10 symbols, then it's two to the power 19.8, which is comparable to four to the power 10. It's actually smaller than four to the power 10. Okay, so if you want to do for 10, then you have to do four to the power 100 which is, this is smaller than 4 to the power 100, actually. Okay, because 4 to the power 100 is 2 to the power 200. This is smaller than that. It's slightly smaller, which is what I was telling Arun earlier. Okay. Um, okay, we have a few more minutes, so let me keep going. So that was the information rate, the source information rate. Um, okay, now I want to get into this notion of typical set. And I'm going to keep this up because this is an important point. So I'll start with the typical set, and then I'll do the uh, homework uh, after the after the break, I guess. Okay. So <clears throat> I have I had said earlier that H of X is the bound on the minimum. Uh, number of bits, expected number of bits that we need for an instantaneous code. Okay, if you have instantaneous code from the craft inequality, we are able to find that we need at least, uh, on average, hx bits. Okay, what if happens if the code is not instantaneous? Okay, maybe I have some funny code, I have some buffering, and so on. What happens then? So, uh, can we do something better? Okay. Uh, or not. The next result, which I'm not going to prove, is a result that says no matter what kind of code you use, whether it's instantaneous or not, or ambiguous or whatever, no matter what, this HX is still going to be a, a lower bound. Okay, so the entropy of a source goes beyond the type of code that we're going to use. Okay, and the, the result is called the asymptotic uh, equipartitioning property. Partitioning property. Okay, and it's often abbreviated AEP in books on information theory. Uh, let me first tell you uh, uh, intuitively what it says, and then we'll get into the, the, the homework example after the, the break. So let me uh, 
consider a message source which is very, very simple, which is generating just zeros and ones. And it generates 0 with probability 0 0.9 and 1 with probability 0 0.1. Let's just say it does that. OK. Now, I start looking at messages which are, let's say, four, uh, 4 bits long. OK, I can certainly do that. So I can look at all, there's 16 of them, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, all the way up to, how am I going to do this, all the way up to 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay, so there are two things that I want to tell you about the source, which are obvious from that. The first thing is that a message of the form 1111, like this guy over here, what is the probability of that message? Assuming, assuming that the symbols are IID, that's that magic phrase again, independent, identically distributed. Identically distributed meaning they all have these properties. Independent meaning the symbols don't interfere with each other, right? So we know what independence is. We know what ID, ID is. So what's the probability of this particular uh, string, 1111? 10 to the minus 4, right? Okay. So that's pretty straightforward. So we can say that this is a very unlikely string, okay? What happens if I look at strings of length 16 bits, okay? So then I have 0, 0, 0, all the way 16, sorry, 0, all 16 bits, all the way to 1, 1, 1, 1, 16 bits. This is going to have probability at 10 to the minus 16. And if I take 80 bits, my magic number, 1, 1, 1, 80 bits is going to be 10 to the minus 80. Okay, this is <laughs> 1 in a proton in universe number, right? So if I have 80 bits, this particular message, all once, but this distribution is extremely unlikely. I mean, in the life of the universe, it may happen once, okay? If the universe has infinite life, it'll happen more than once, but then who cares, <laughs> okay? The point I'm trying to make over here is that we certainly can think about some messages being unlikely and some messages being likely, okay? Does that make sense? I can certainly point to you that this is a very unlikely message. This has got nothing to do with how the coding is being done. I've got nothing to do with coding whatsoever. I'm just telling you some messages are likelier than others based on this. I've not said it's an instantaneous code or not. Okay? Some messages are more likely than others. That's a fact. Okay? Clear? Second fact. The second fact is that some messages look like others when viewed the right way. So let's take this message from the four bits to look at 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and uh, <laughs> let's see, 0, 0, 1, 0. From my perspective, they're all equally probable. They all have three zeros and one one, okay? So I don't care. I mean, of course, this message has certain meaning to the recipient, but from the perspective of the channel or the perspective of information theory, they're the same. Okay, they have the same probability. Okay, and once we start looking at this, we say, oh, wait a minute, this is just a binomial distribution. I can tell you what is the probability of those things. This is basically nothing more than, you know, 4 choose 1, okay, 0 0.1 to the, uh, which is the zeros, so 0 0.1. Uh, and then 0 0.9, so I have how many? I have 1, 1 over here, so it's 0.1 to the uh, 0 0.1, and it's 0.1 to the 0.9, right? That's going to be the probability from the binomial distribution, okay, of, of this particular, uh, of this particular value, just the, that's just the binomial, right? So, uh, Why is there a power of 0.1? Oh, gosh, what do I mean? <laughs> Serves me right for doing this one in the, in my, uh, on the board, okay, yeah. 3 and 1, right? It's p to the, p to the a, a, q to the, whatever, 1 minus p to the power n minus whatever. So this is, this is the binomial. <laughs> I'd better take a break. <laughs> okay. Uh, so anyway, we know this. The point I'm trying to make here is that all these four possibilities get clubbed into that combinatorial expression. And this one is going to be, uh, is essentially, uh, in this case, you know, 80 choose 1, you know, 0.1 to the power 80, okay? So that's why it's uh, 80 choose, yeah. So it's going to be really, really uh, uh, small, 80 choose 0. 
80 juice 80. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. That's even better. Yeah, that's right. So, so this tells us that if they are IID, the binomial distribution gives us some idea of what it is. And what does the binomial distribution look like? If I, I can approximate it by the Gaussian, okay, it's not exactly Gaussian, but it's going to have, if, if I take 80, then it's, the mean is going to be 40, and I'm going to get sort of a stepwise thing, you know, like this, okay, going up to the top, and then something like that, and it's going to be, you know, something like that, okay, it's approximately a Gaussian. Of course, it doesn't have infinite extent. Right? It doesn't have infinite extent and it doesn't go below zero, right? It's going to be bounded. However, the mass, probability mass, lies over here, okay? And everything else on the sides is not very much. So I'm actually drawing something. It probably looks more like this, actually. Okay, it goes steeply up and down. So <clears throat> we can therefore think, given a, a skew distribution of probabilities like this, 0.9 and 0.1, that there are some messages, or many messages actually, which lie here. And not too many messages, so let me get rid of this thing over here and just show you the, the other remaining messages, which are going to be lying on the tail, so to speak, like this. And we'll call this set typical and we'll call this set atypical. Okay, again, this got nothing to do with coding. This is just talking about message sources. Okay, so if we have IID, then we can talk like this. There's some typical messages, some atypical messages. And the theorem here basically says that the number of typical messages, okay, is given by approximately uh, 2 to the power hx, h of x. Okay. So the typical set size is approximately 2 to the hx, and this uh, is an asymptotic result. That's why it's called asymptotic equipartition property, okay? So if m, the message length is small, then the typical set size and the atypical set size are close to each other. But if m is large enough asymptotically, if m goes to infinity, what will happen is that we're going to divide the set of messages into those in the typical set and those in the atypical set. And we can make the fraction of messages in the atypical set as small as we want by taking the message length as large, as, large enough. Okay. Okay, and the equipartitioning part essentially means that we don't really care, uh, you know, like I said, I don't really care about 0, 0, 0, 0001 and 0, 0, 0010 0 and so on. All these four messages are the same, so they're equally, they're all the same. Okay, so that's where the equipartition comes. Another way of thinking about it is that all the messages here are basically the same. If it's typical, it's all the same. They're all in the same class and they all fall into this over here. Now here is what happens. If the number of messages is 2 to the hx, to represent them, I need approximately hx bits. Okay? Because I take the logarithm. They're equal. And we, we know that if we have 2 to the k equiprobable messages, the logarithm of that is the number of messages. That's, a, that's the first thing we studied. If I have n equiprobable messages, then the entropy is log n. Here I have 2 to the hx EP probable messages, therefore I need hx bits. It's pretty straightforward. And so, independent of the coding that I use, if I have IID variables, I can tell you that I need about hx bits, okay? About, because I have this asymptotic thing, right? It's only true for infinite message lengths, but we're going to ignore that. About hx bits, roughly. And so when I go back to this picture over here, I started out by saying that the instantaneous code needs hx, but now I'm saying no matter what the code is, I still need hx. And that's why we have this deep meaning of entropy, okay? As the message length increases asymptotically due to this equatorial partitioning property, which actually turns out to be derivable 
from the weak law of large numbers. And of course, you can do it from strong law as well, but it, it, it only needs a weak law. It's just a restatement of the weak law of, the, of large numbers, and uh, that gives us this. And the weak law of large numbers, if you remember, basically says that the, the sum of a set of values converges to the mean. Or actually, the average of a set of values converges to the true mean. So we can sort of think of the, the, you know, the proof. Basically, the mean is this point right here. And as you make the sum larger and larger, it gets closer and closer, narrower and narrower, right? And in, in, in the binomials, in the probabilistic sense. And so the messages are going to be more and more tightly packed around 2 to the hx. In the limit, all the messages are going to be exactly at the mean in the limit. And so we get this 2 to the hx result from there. So there's a, there's a very close relationship between the asymptotic equipartitioning property and the law of, law of large numbers. Okay. All right. So any questions about this? Okay. So to sum up, all I've said so far basically is that we've got this model for a channel. And now using that property, I can tell you that no matter what uh, coding I'm using, Okay, a remote redundancy, et cetera, et cetera. No matter what I'm doing over here, if the message source has an intrinsic entropy of hx, then the channel coder is going to have to somehow carry hx number of bits per message. Okay, that's, that's the job it has to do. And then the first result is going to pop right out, which is that if the capacity of the channel is kc bits per second, it's just no way you can carry this message source across that unless Kc is greater than Hx, right? So more precisely, we need the, we want Kc is greater than uh, mHx, right? Because the, this is the message rate. Each message has Hx bits of redundancy. We better make sure the channel can carry that. So each symbol carries K different bits, and the symbol rate is C, symbols per second. So this result is holds, and this is called the channel capacity theorem. It's Shannon's first theorem, Shannon's channel capacity theorem. This is for a noiseless channel, okay? But I'll, I'll probably come back to this after the, after the break. Okay, any questions about this? Uh, yeah. Beg your pardon? Yeah. No, 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 MHX is the entropy rate, right? And this is the channel rate channel capacity, so the, we don't have a 2 -ray. The number of distinct messages is 2 to the mhx, but then the number of distinct messages that can be carried by the channel is 2 to the power kc, so. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the typical messages, and uh, I guess maybe I should just do the homework problem for that. So <clears throat> one, one thing that you should remember is that the typical set is meaningful only when the probability distribution of the messages is uh, skewed, okay? If the messages are uh, equiprobable, you can't do much about them because every message is typical, okay? Intuitively speaking, if I show you a TV screen in which any pixel could be black or white for the sake of example, I can show you a random dot pattern, it's equiprobable, right? I've got to encode the whole thing. It's got a tremendous amount of entropy. Whereas if I'm showing you pictures of, you know, whatever uh, natural scenes, things aren't equiprobable. Okay, so we have, you can eliminate redundancy. Okay, so the typical set size as a ratio of the set of all possible messages is very large when we have equiprobable messages. And that's what I was going to show you with the two. So in the first case, when we had A, B, C, D having the ratios 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, h of x turns out to be 1.98, which is almost 2. And so the, the ratio is going to be 2 to the power 19.8 for 10 symbols over 4 to the power 10, which is actually equal to approximately 87%. Okay. So first, the typical set is pretty large. Second, what you'll notice is even though the gap between 1.98 and 2 is only 0.02, very, very small gap, still we get a 13% reduction. Okay, that's actually quite impressive. 
Okay, and uh, you can kind of extend this if you have message length 100, this 2 to the power 198 over 4 to the power uh, 200. If you do this, for example, you'll see it's, it's smaller than 87% and so on. So still going to be smaller. Yeah? I uh, actually used Wolfram and I got like the whole precision was all those decimal digits. Yeah. And it was 90%. 90%, okay. I used a pocket calculator, <laughs> which I had from my undergrad school from 1980, 82, and it gave me 87%. <laughs> I had that calculator I got as an undergrad when I joined engineering school, and I still use it almost every day, so, because I can do the whole, I can do everything without even looking at the keypad anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, more importantly, if you buy a calculator today, it still looks the same. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Calculators haven't evolved in the last, you know, 30 years, you know, since 1982. Look at calculator from 82 and look at a calculator that my daughter has, which I bought, I don't know, a couple of, a couple of months ago. They're almost the same, and they cost the same, too. So somebody is making a lot of money. <laughs> because they just manufactured them in 82 and they're selling them every year, <laughs> you know, from this big warehouse. Okay, on the other hand, if you make this distribution skew, which is what I did for the second problem, then we have A, B, C, D as uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.7, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. Then we find that the, uh, then the H is going to be 1.36. Again, from my pocket cal calculator. And actually, for this, I use a spreadsheet. And then the ratio is going to be 2 to the power 13.6 over 4 to the power 10, which turns out to be 0 0.011. Oops. Okay, which is approximately 1.1%. Okay, so like 99 something percent roughly is going to be atypical. The typical set is only 1.1%. You're looking confused, yes? H of y. Say it again? H of, y. H of y, right, I call it y instead of x, thank you. Daniel, what's the real number here? Is it not? I think it's about right, yeah. So uh, you can see, again, the purpose of showing you this was for you to discover yourself that the skew distribution uh, changes things a lot. You go from 1% over here to 87%. And obviously, if it was all the same, it would be 100%. Typical set would be identical to the uh, uh, actual set. Uh, there would be, in other words, all messages would be typical. So in some sense, what we uh, what we're trying to say here is that uh, redundancy, okay, uh, is expressed by the fact that uh, the distributions are skew. Okay, if the if the distributions are equally probable, there's no redundancy. Everything anything might happen. Okay, so skew distributions encode the fact that certain things are more likely than other things. Okay, and because of this, we have an intrinsic uh, loss of entropy. And let's go back to the first thing I said right in the beginning, which is that, you know, we get this result because if a you know, dog bites a man, it's not news, right? We have, it's, a, it's a likely event. We don't code for it. There's no newspaper headlines. Whereas a man bites a dog, we code for it. So it's an unlikely event. This is a man biting a dog right here, okay? So when we do that, we basically have, uh, sorry, this is the other way around. This is a dog biting a man. This one, you know, a dog and men bite each other all the time, okay? I mean, so, so, so we, we, okay. Importantly, for the, for the sake of the discussion, okay, I'll show that in just, okay, anyway, this is the homework. Let me go on to the uh, channel theorem, capacity theorem. So here we're going to consider a channel which transmits C symbols per second, and we have two to the K symbols. And so, our channel capacity is going to be Kc bits per second, okay? And over there, we have a message rate of m messages per second. And the uh, asymptotic equipartition property tells us that we have most messages are going to be, okay, most messages are going to be typical. Typical messages are going to have an entropy of hx bits, okay? And so we're going to have a message rate, uh, sorry, a, a bit, uh, an information rate of mhx bits per second of entropy. So we have this many bits of entropy being generated, 
and we have a capacity of this. So if this capacity is less than that, out of luck. Okay. So what we need to do is we, we, we've got to make sure that Kc, oops, Kc is less, greater than nHx. Okay, I'm going to actually take a, pa a pause for a moment. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what's going on because um, <clears throat> there's a hidden assumption being made over here which I want to make very clear. So going back to this, we have sort of uh, the notion of uh, this distribution of message probabilities. And as I said earlier, we have this, uh, this typical set and this is the atypical set in orange. What we're doing over here is that we're saying that the number of messages over here is 2 to the power hx. Fine, that's the theorem. Okay. And so this means that we can code, code using hx bits per message. Okay, that's fine. But I didn't tell you what happened to these orange guys over here. Okay. What happens if the source generates a atypical message? Okay. In the work we're going to do from now on, we're just going to ignore it. We're going to say, sorry, can't encode it. Just let it be. Just drop it, basically. What happens when you drop it? We get an error. We get some error rate. Okay. This error rate can be viewed as being uh, the channel dropping the message. So what's actually happening is that the channel coder gets an atypical message. It looks at it and says, oops, I don't have it in my code book. Okay? Because we have a code book that says, if this is a message, this is what I'm going to output. Because right? that's how we do the source coding. Channel, so, uh, the, the, the channel coder says it's not there, it just drops it. Okay? It's as if the channel dropped it. However, we can make this drop rate as small as we want by looking at long enough messages. Okay. What this means is that we only, but, but, but what, what this means is that we just need to look at the source generation rate over here of mhx. We're only going to get mhx bits per second being put into the channel. And so the hidden assumption is that all atypical messages are silently ignored. We're just going to pretend that they didn't come. Okay? And it goes in the channel loss rate. And uh, what we'll do is make it as small as we want. Okay? So just intrinsically, as part of the theory, we are willing to drop certain messages. Maybe one in a billion, one in a trillion, doesn't matter. Okay, we just say, we're not going to be perfect, we're going to drop stuff. Okay? And this is a revolutionary advance in terms of how people thought about channels. Okay? When Shannon was doing this work, people were sending messages already. Radio and telegraphy and television were all there, right? But the engineers doing this work were struggling because they couldn't get past certain limits. They didn't really understand what was going on. They say, well, we went from 4 QAM to QAM 16, and you know, somehow things don't work. And they had the seat of the pants understanding of how far they could push things. But this theorem over here, the channel capacity theorem, gave them a very, very clear understanding of exactly how far they could go, assuming the new MHX. And the second thing was they were trying to get a perfect channel. Right? Imagine you're the, in charge of the phone system because all this work was done at AT&T, which was a phone company. And you go to your boss and you say, you know, uh, some messages I'm not going to carry. Okay? I mean, what kind of message is that to go? You can't tell your boss, uh, sorry, we don't do it. No, you're the phone company. You're supposed to carry every message. He says, no, if it's atypical, I don't want it. Okay? And that's what we're doing over here. We're saying we're not going to code. Okay? Because if you do code all the messages, Okay, we may end up with sending requiring more than hx bits, right? Because the size of this over here is two to the hx, whereas the size of this is basically two to the power m. Uh, what is it, m or something like that? Okay, it's going to be something larger, right? This is this one over here, like four to the ten, right? So if I code for this, I need a very large code, but most of it is not being used. Okay, so. So I'm going to say, look, I'm only coding for typical messages. And that, again, also allows us to completely get away from requiring instantaneous codes. It doesn't matter what the code is. It doesn't matter what the code is or anything. As long as we only code typical messages, we can essentially upper bound, uh, sorry, lower bound, 
the uh, bits that we need to carry by MHX, that's all we care about. Okay, that's the message that we're going to carry, about, carry over here. And then we can look at the channel, compare the two, and Shannon's first theorem says that if the channel capacity is greater than this, we can carry that source. If it's less than this, we can't carry it. Okay, okay. and uh, there's a greater than, not a greater than, equal to, and I don't remember exactly why it's not a greater than, equal to, but it is in fact a greater than. There's not equality over here. Okay, I'm going to stop with this, and uh, I'll, next time we'll continue with the noisy channel, so 9.5.3. I would suggest you go and read through joint probability one more time because to understand 9.5.3, uh, you really, really need to understand joint probability, which we, I covered last, last week, but it would be good to go over it again.